scripture reading comes from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. That's Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. For where a testament is, there must also be of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator is liveth. We welcome you this morning, those who are here and those who are watching online. We're in the midst of a five lesson series on the Old Covenant, the Law of Moses, and why it has passed away. This is lesson number four. If you will imagine, please, as I often like people to do, a timeline that starts on your left and goes to your right, then about 1,500 years before Christ, let's say the pulpit here is the time of Christ, about 1,500 years, or maybe over to that wall or so, the Law of Moses was in effect for the people of Israel. It was there to teach them a whole lot of things leading up to the Christ. But it was not the Christian dispensation under which we live. Things changed at the time of Christ. That's what we've seen in three previous lessons. Why was the old law there? It was for one nation, one nation only, to write down what sin was so people could understand what sin was. And that was a blessing. Because a lot of nations out there just sort of groped in the dark for what sin was and God might have to send someone to correct them now and then. A prophet from Israel going to Assyria or some other nation. But there was for the people of Israel, God's chosen people, a written law to which they could refer to see what was wrong in the eyes of the one who made them. We have a lot of people today who say there's no such thing as right and wrong. It's all made up by your culture. It's all made up by your class. That's false. That's a lie. It's made up by God who made us. And he has the right to do it because of all that he's done for us. And even if he hadn't done anything for us, he's still the one in charge. But he's loved us and sent his son to die for us. The old law was to teach us about that and bring us to Christ. The old law then offered forgiveness only in prospect. Only in anticipation. That is, they could offer bulls, they could offer goats, they could offer rams for their sins, but those sins would only be forgiven in prospect and would not be totally forgiven until the time of Christ, until He came and shed His perfect blood as the once for all sacrifice for people. Nevertheless, the Old Testament calls God a God pardoning iniquity, a God of forgiveness, a God of graciousness. Those people could experience some level of forgiveness, some level of atonement, because God is a timeless God. God knew that Christ would come, and when he promised Christ would come, it was as good as done. God knew that when they did the things that they, God wanted them to do under that law, that they would be forgiven once Christ came and their souls would be offered a place in heaven, it would be proffered, I say, assured a place in heaven because of the grace and mercy that was shown through Jesus Christ when he finally came. We then noticed in lesson three some images that tell us that the old covenant has passed away because there are people who deny that. What are the scriptures, they might ask, which tell us that the old law has passed away? Well, they're numerous in the New Testament. Sometimes they're bound up in these images. First of all, Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, speaks of the old law as being a tutor to bring us to Christ. It uses the word pedagogue, which was a slave who took the master's children and brought them to school so they could learn. Well, the old law was... The, in the purpose of God, a servant that took us by the hand and brings us to the new law in Christ so that we can learn the law of Christ there. The old law was fading away, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 and 7 says, and replaced by the new perfect covenant. The old law was a wall of commandments contained in ordinances, a wall between Jew and Gentile, but Ephesians 2 tells us it was broken down so that we could be united under Christ. The old law 
was nailed to the cross, Colossians chapter 2 says. And when you nail something shut, it's nailed. That's an idea of permanence. And the old law, finally, was like a, a, a marriage in that a person who is married is committed to that spouse as long as that spouse is living. But if that person marries somebody else while that first spouse is living, they're in adultery, Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3 says. Therefore, we've been released from the law. We died to it. We died to the law we were held by, Romans 7 says, so that we could serve and be married to, figuratively speaking, the law of Christ. Now, all that's a lot of theology we've discussed in the first three lessons, that God unfolded his plan a little bit at a time so that we could understand these things. What practical implication does that have to us? Why should I care that the old covenant has passed away? What is the big deal to me? How does it affect my worship? How does it affect my practice? How does it affect my daily living? Matter of fact, sometimes preachers like me might sound confusing. We say that we don't live by the old law, but we learn from the old law. We learn how God feels about false worship. In places like Leviticus 10, where Nadab and Abihu offer strange incense and are consumed by fire. We learn how God feels about rebellion. We learn how God feels about various crimes in the Old Testament law. But what is it then we're supposed to not observe from the Old Testament law? What is it then that's done away with? What is it then that's not in the New Testament that was in the Old Testament? What is it that we cannot borrow from the Old Testament and put in New Testament practice? I don't claim that this list is exhaustive, but we'll discuss just a few quick things this morning. Number one, incense. In the tabernacle that God designed, there was an altar for burning incense right before the veil that, before, that was before you went into the most holy place. Where was the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God among his people? The priests would have to daily light that incense, burn that incense, and there'd be a cloud before the veil there. Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 9. And then on the Day of Atonement, one day a year, when the high priest was allowed into the most holy place, he had to burn some of that incense to make a cloud, lest he see everything clearly in the most holy place, and therefore die. That's all you see about incense in the Old Testament. There are a few passages that describe how it's supposed to be made. There is that passage in Leviticus chapter 10 that tells us that Nadab and Abihu offered strange incense which the Lord had not commanded and therefore they died. In the New Testament, what, does, what is said about incense? Well, in Luke chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, at that point the father-to-be of John the Baptist, was a priest and it came his turn to offer incense. Remember the Gospels were talking about the Old Testament law. Christ said things that would be applicable in the New Testament, but they're living under Old Testament law still because Christ had not died yet. Zacharias was offering incense. And then to my knowledge, you don't see anything else about it till the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, in these highly apocalyptic scenes, you have the throne room of God, one sitting on the throne holding a scroll. Nobody's able to open the scroll except a lamb that represents Jesus Christ. A lamb as though it had been slain, representing Jesus dying by crucifixion. And the lamb comes and takes the scroll out of the hand of the one on the throne and starts to open the seals. When he takes the scroll, Revelation 5 verse 8 records that the four living creatures and 24 elders that surrounded the throne fell down before the lamb each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. There's a picture. These things aren't meant to be a part of the New Testament church. They're meant to be a part of heaven. And so I'm not concerned with what happened in the tabernacle and temple in Old Testament worship. And I'm not concerned with what happens in heaven in worship. I'm concerned with what we're supposed to be doing now. But these things are a picture that you get that represents something else. And here this incense is representing the prayers of the saints that goes up before God. Something physical under the schoolmaster, something visible under the schoolmaster is representing something invisible in the apocalyptic vision of heaven. 
You see the same thing in Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 and 4 where the seventh seal of that scroll is opened. Another angel comes forth and starts to sound and he sounded out with the prayers of all the saints that was before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. The only other time incense is mentioned in the New Testament is Revelation 18 verse 13 where there is a picture of the Babylonian government, that is the spiritual Babylon, the evil beast that rose out of the sea to enslave all nations. They, well, they gained their riches by the trade of a lot of different things. And one of the things that they traded for wealth was incense. Incense is mentioned in Old Testament worship. Incense is mentioned in heaven as representing the prayers of the saints. But it's not mentioned in New Testament worship practice. So I don't want to add to the Word of God and practice it. That's one of those things that's left to the Old Covenant. We should not want to add to the Word of God because of the multitude of passages that remind us not to add to the Word of God in both the Old and the New Covenants. We're not going to add that to our worship. It's a relic of the Old Testament law. A second relic of the Old Testament law is a special class of people being priests. In the Old Testament law, the tribe of Levi was designated to be the priests for the rest of the people. Specifically, those within the tribe of Levi that descended from Moses' brother Aaron were designed to be the priests, and from them would come the high priest. Then the rest of the tribe of Levi were designed to take care of the holy things around the tabernacle and assist the priesthood. You can read about that in Exodus 28 and 29, Numbers 3 and 4. The high priests then would serve until they died, but that's the point. They died, and then someone else would have to come. Hebrews chapter 7 points out that even though those were the times when the high priest would die, now we have a high priest who will not die. He's ascended to his throne. He's our high priest because he's offered his own blood for our sins. He ever lives to make intercession for those who come to God through him. He's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And he died once for all so that the sacrifices didn't have to be offered by the priests. And now all Christians are priests in the imagery that we're given from the Old Testament that applies in the New. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 speaks of the church this way. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I'm a priest today. You're a priest today if you're a member of the Lord's church. Hebrews teaches over and over again that you're able to simply bow your head and go into the most holy place of God. They couldn't do that in the Old Covenant. They had to offer the sacrifices through the priests. And even the priests couldn't get into the very presence of God as represented in that tabernacle. Only the high priest could do so once a year. But now, Christ, our high priest, mediates our very prayers for us to the very throne of God in reality. Something that they could see in the tabernacle and temple represents something that we cannot see. So there's not a special class of people that are lifted up above priests uh, or lifted up above regular members of the church. There's no clergy and laity distinction in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, Jesus addressed that very carefully to some people in Matthew chapter 23. In verses 8 through 11, he told these religious teachers of the day, But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Now people will quibble with that passage to say, well, we call our third grade teachers teacher, and I call my dad father. And even Paul called himself a father to those he, whom he had converted in some sense. The difference is the meaning behind it. If we are lifting people up above others with such titles, 
whatever they be, it ought not be done. Even sometimes we might do it with brother so and so. We call this person by his first name, that person by his first name, but this person brother and then his last name. And we might even be lifting that person up above everybody else. Christ said not to do that. That's a relic of the Old Testament law. Sacrifices, animal sacrifices are a relic of the Old Testament law. Most people don't have much problem with this because nobody likes the unpleasant idea of sacrificing an animal. It's unpleasant enough to kill an animal to be able to eat the meat. Sometimes people don't even realize that has to be done. Why do you have to kill that animal? Can't you just get your meat from a store? People have been known to say, well, yeah, yeah, somebody had to kill that animal. But to do it in a ritualistic fashion where blood had to be sprinkled in certain places and there had to be certain things that were done with it with a grain offering and a drink offering. It's very unpleasant. So a lot of people don't have trouble with this. But sacrifices of the Old Testament, well, they're a relic. Why? Hebrews chapter 9, in several different verses, reminds us that those things back then were purified by blood. But it was the blood of animals. And those things that they were purifying, the tabernacle that they were purifying, were, were copies of the things that are actually in the heavens, Hebrews 9, 23. And so these things in the heavens had to be purified with better sacrifices than the Old Testament had. Well, what, is, what are those better sacrifices? There's one, it says. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, that's the tabernacle, but now he's entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of other animals. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the age, in these last days, the Christian era, he's offered himself once. He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of many. Hebrew, that's Hebrews 9, 23 through 28, which is a couple of comments from me. And then there's Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 14, which speaks of those Old Testament priests. In those intermediate times when in 30 A.D. Christ had died and in 70 A.D. Jerusalem was destroyed. And in between then, there were priests meaninglessly offering sacrifices, trying to perpetuate the Jewish system of worship. The Bible says there in Hebrews 10 verse 11, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of the God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Not a lot of people, I don't think, want to restore animal sacrifices. But there are, at least now, but there are some who think they're going to be restored in the future. Those who teach a thousand year reign of Christ on earth after this world that we know is done claim that Christ will set up a kingdom in Jerusalem and animal sacrifices, the rituals of the temple will be restored. There are many problems with that doctrine. The one in our purview today is this. What? an insult to Christ's blood to say that he will come back and start the lesser sacrifices of animals again after he offered his precious blood once for all. No sacrifices are a relic of the Old Testament law, the law of Moses. A lot of feasts, special days are a relic of the Old Testament law. In Leviticus chapter 23, you could read about some of these feasts. There was the Passover and unleavened bread that came on the first month, the 14th and 15th day of the month with seven days of unleavened bread following. There was the Feast of Weeks, which later became known as the Feast of Pentecost to take place 50 days after that last Sabbath. There was the Feast of Tabernacles, in which the people dwelt in tabernacles to commemorate their time in the wilderness. There was the Day of Atonement on the tenth day of the seventh month, where the priest went into the most holy place once a year. But there's only one special time authorized by the New Testament. None of those are repeated. 
The only special time authorized by the new covenant is Sunday. Where on the first day of the week, the disciples met together to take of the Lord's Supper. Acts chapter 20 verse 7 indicates that Lord's Supper we just partook in which we take of the bread to remember the Lord's body and we take of the blood to or fruit of the vine to remember his blood. And these do not literally turn into anything in your mouth. When Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, he was speaking metaphorically just like he was when he said, I am the door. I am the great shepherd. How could, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, how could he say, this is my body, when he was still in his body? How could he say, this is my blood, when he was still in his blood? He wanted us to use these as representations of things. I wanted to say this because in the first century, the Christians were accused of being cannibals for eating flesh and drinking blood behind closed doors. Well, it was a representation, all was meant to be, by which we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And that's the only authorized feast I know of in the New Covenant. Instruments were used in the Old Covenant. In Second Chronicles chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, there's a, a joyous, triumphant passage that has people coming together to praise God and they bring their trumpets and they bring their instruments of music and they raise their voice to be heard in praise and thanking the Lord. They use trumpets, they use cymbals, they use instruments of music. They praise the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And then the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. And what was the cloud? Verse 14 of that passage says, For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now people might point to that passage and say, See, God approves. But that was Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, all you see is singing. In about 10 or 11 passages, if I remember correctly, that's all that you see. Christ and his apostles sang a hymn before they went out to the Mount of Olives after he had... Inst after, after he had... Uh, been in the garden with them. Matthew 26 verse 30 and Mark 14 verse 26. Paul and Silas were singing and praying in prison in Acts 16 25. I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. The apostle Paul spoke in Romans 15 verse 9. I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5.19. Teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, Colossians 3, verse 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms, James 5, verse 13. Once again, the visible, the physical, in the old covenant was used. But it points to something more spiritual in the New Covenant. They made melody and plucked instruments in the Old Covenant. But now we're supposed to pluck the strings of our hearts. I don't want to add to that. Do you? In view of all those passages? Remember concerning the priesthood. When the priesthood was being changed from the tribe of Levi so that Christ could be a priest. The whole law had to be changed. Hebrews 7 indicates. The key passage in that verse is verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. God had never said that people from Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali could not be priests. But when he said people who were Levites should be priests, that automatically eliminated everybody else. When God specifies something, that does away with everything else. And isn't it true then that when God specifies singing, it does away with everything else and we ought to just stick to what God says? Instruments of music are a relic of the Old Testament just like sacrifices. Do we want to bring sacrifices back if we're going to take part of the Old Covenant? What about circumcision? So many people in New Testament times wanted to bring circumcision from the old law into the new. Do you know what the Apostle Paul told them in the first few verses of Galatians? If you bind circumcision, if you bind one part of the law, he said, you've got to bind the whole law. So if you're going to take 
sac instrument, you've got to take sacrifices and feasts and incense and a priesthood. No, it's a relic of the Old Testament. And then the way that they were saved in the Old Testament is a relic now as well. They had to offer animal sacrifices. And they could have forgiveness of sins in anticipation. When John the Baptist came at the end of Old Testament times, he preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, Mark chapter 1 verse 4. But that baptism was only in effect for the time that he was here, which was very short. And then Christ died on the cross and resurrected from the dead. And before he ascended to heaven, he instituted these new terms of pardon. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And he said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. And he taught that that baptism was a burial in water in the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection in Romans chapter 6. He taught that you had to be a believer to be baptized. Someone who's not capable of believing has no need of being baptized. He or she hasn't sinned if they're not old enough to know or they have a mental deficiency. They don't need to be. But baptism is a part of that plan of salvation. A believer's baptism. I believe that I've sinned. I believe Jesus has the ability to take away my sin. I'll confess him before men the way he said to do. And I'll repent of my sins and I'll be baptized for the remission of my sins. That's what people in the new covenant are supposed to do. But someone says, wait a minute. I want to be saved like the thief on the cross. Who was reviling Christ to start with. But then repented of that. And asked, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus indeed promised the man, Assuredly I say to you, this day you'll be with me in paradise. But did you catch the difference there? People will say he didn't need to be baptized. No, he didn't. With Christ's baptism. Because Christ's baptism is a likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection, and Christ hadn't died yet. And Christ's baptism is a part of his last will and testament, if you will, and a will and testament doesn't come into effect until after you're dead. Hebrews 9, 16 and 17 that Matt read for us a few moments ago remind us of this in context of the old law switching to the new law. For where there is a testament or a will, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. I have my will written. But I could go change it tomorrow if I live. I can go change it next week if I live. I can change it up till the moment I die. And my children don't get my stuff while I live. But after I die and after Marcia passes, then they're likely to get whatever we have based on the will coming into effect. Well, Christ's will for his baptism had not yet been in effect when he was on the cross along with that thief. And so that thief's salvation mirrors in no way what we must do for salvation. For us to be saved, we must believe in Christ. We must turn away from our sins, confess him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's the new covenant way. We have to be able to believe. We have to be able to confess. And we have to be able to, of our own will, be born again of the water and the spirit. That's the whole point. We're choosing this kingdom. We're choosing this. In the old covenant, Hebrews, remember, Hebrews 8, remember, they were born into it and then they learned about it. But in this new covenant, we learn about it, then we choose to be born into it. Born of the water and the spirit. There was a woman that Jesus met at a well in John chapter 4. This woman was concerned about how to worship. She said that the Samaritans would worship on this one particular mountain. But the Jews believed that you should worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said, the hour is coming in which you're not going to worship on that mountain. And you're not going to worship in Jerusalem either. For the hour is coming 
that all true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So you see the beauty of the old covenant in being a tutor, a schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ. You could see the incense. They represent the unseen prayers of the saints. You could see a separate class of priests that intervened for people. Now we all intervene through ourselves, through the high priest Christ. You could see the sacrifices. And except for that generation that saw Christ on the cross, nobody sees his sacrifice. We read about it through the testimony of the eyewitnesses. And we believe it. They could have these great feasts with, with music and special events that cause them to remember on a grand scale. But we have a simple, timeless, precious, weekly remembrance that proclaims the Lord's death till he comes. They had physical instruments. We have the instrument of the heart. That's the difference in the Old and New Covenant. Today... We don't offer dead sacrifices. We're supposed to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And aren't you thankful? For 2,000 years, preachers have been standing up preaching about God coming to earth in flesh so that men could go to heaven to be with God. Don't forget, in all the disaster and disease don't forget, even in times of triumph and victory, that the only thing that matters is getting through this life to be with God. We'll be somewhere for eternity. It'll either be with the devil and his torments or with the Lord and his comforts. Where would you choose? You get to choose it. Nobody chooses it for you. What would you do? If we could help you, would you please come as we stand and sing this morning?